I'd just like to uh, add to the chorus of thanks for the, uh, for the organization of this event. It's been a real feast of uh, thinkers on technology. So thank you very much, Jerry. Um, was... And I have to say, as somebody who enjoys reading books about the politics of technology, I feel like my bookshelf is coming to life in front of me, um, minus some of the dead guys, of course. Um, and um, it's also very good to follow after Debbie talking about the, the real world effects of genetic engineered crops because the next box that I'm going to open, this uh, Pandora's box if you like of synthetic biology is often considered as the next stage of genetic engineering. It's often called extreme genetic engineering because um, it uses the new tools and techniques which the genetic engineers are now using to manipulate life forms. Um, in fact, there's a there's a graph that often comes to my mind from about 2008 from the Department of Commerce, which uh, has two curves. One curve is the uh, development of genetically modified organisms from about 1974 through to 2020 or something, and it goes something like this. And the other is the development of synthetic biology products and processes from about 2008, and it goes like this um, exponentially. And at the point where those two curves cross, well, that's the point at which synthetic biology becomes the way in which we do genetic engineering, which is roughly speaking about now. It's sort of the equivalent of how in the middle of the 1990s, digital production of photography became the way in which we do photography. Well, now digital production of life forms is becoming the way in which we do genetic engineering. But all of that said, um, for the rest of this talk, I'd like you to stop thinking about genetic engineering. Because sometimes it's not useful to look at a new technological platform through the lens of the previous technology. It's like trying to think about the importance of the computer through considering typewriters. A more useful lens to talk about synthetic biology might in fact be manufacturing and production. Um, and another useful lens actually is Star Trek. So, as, as a kid, I used to watch Star Trek occasionally, talk about techno-utopianism. And um, one of the things that used to interest me a lot with the technologies, they had these little flip communicator machines that are now cell phones. Um, but particularly, there was a technology called a matter compiler. Do people know about matter compilers? A matter compiler was a sort of digital make-anything machine. Um, Captain Jean-Luc Picard would walk up to the matter compiler and he would say, computer. Tea, Earl Grey, hot, and zoop, there would be a cup of tea. And as a child, I imagined, wow, you could go up to it and you could say, computer, ice cream, or computer, um, plastic Star Wars figures, and it would just give it to you. And that, that sounded like a very cool thing. Um, today, you know, you grow up, and we realize that those, uh, those flip phone communicators come with a whole host of problems. In fact, as Doug Tompkins was talking about earlier, and we'll hear more about. And so it is with a matter compiler. I think today I would strongly, strongly resist the creation of a matter compiler, uh, a make-anything machine in this, this society. That if we had a machine that could just zoop, make anything, it would uh, upend all sorts of economies. It would destroy meaningful ways of living. It would increase inequality, and it would probably harm the environment. Um, certainly, um, it would be owned by some god awful mega corporation or the military, um, probably both. And um, the reason I feel all of this is from watching the field of synthetic biology for the past few years, which is kind of the closest we've come to date to a matter compiler, a machine that can make anything. Um, so just, you know, just as an aside, we kind of have machines that can make anything on the 2D world. Uh, we have machines that can create any image or sound or audio or video that we want. Uh, something um, like a, a digital printer or an um, MP3 player. Uh, what those do is they take actual sound waves and light waves and images and they turn it into digital information that can then be reconstituted once again as, as real actual images and sound. And, and that's incredible. It means that I can, you know, I can take one of these matter compiler things, I can take a photo of this, uh, this audience, and within a few minutes I can have 200,000 t-shirts with this photo printed out in China um, or, or put on the side of a building in Times Square. But that's not a cup of tea or, or a, a, a vanilla ice cream. However, that, that, that process of digitization, which started with sound and text and image, is now moving on to digitization of matter. 
Um, and the most obvious part of this, of atoms, of real stuff, and the most obvious part of this is 3D printers. So I can get a 3D sensing wand, I can kind of put it over this audience and then print you all out in sort of glorious ABS thermoplastic. Um, but that wouldn't be um, a make anything machine. It would just be a model of you. To actually make a real copy of you, I would have to have a kind of print head that would print out all the the skin and the bones and the blood in exactly the right place, that would be able to print out exactly the right different molecules and compounds where you want them. And that is what brings us to synthetic biology. Because the synthetic biologists um, and the industries that, that are supporting synthetic biology believe that they have little tiny machines such as bacteria and yeast and so forth that can print out compounds at will, kind of 3D printers for chemicals. Um, and you might have noticed I just did a kind of unusual thing just there. I talked about living organisms, um, yeast, bacteria, as machines. And this is pretty central to the way the, the synthetic biologists think. Next week we have something called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition that's about to happen in Boston. Not organisms, machines. Um, because synthetic biologists would say we already have a very efficient kind of matter compiler that's able to produce many hundreds of thousands of compounds out of pretty basic um, inputs, and that's nature, it's biology. Biology can take carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and arrange it into anything from the iridescence of mother of pearl to the hardness of a coconut shell to the sort of pungent compounds that are the smell of garlic. Um, and it does all that through these little machines, um, whether they're um, coconut trees or bacteria or so forth. You know, when a synthetic biologist looks at a, at a forest, they don't see just a beautiful ecosystem, they see a large-scale production system for, for compounds. And they want to know how they can interface with that and begin to control which compounds are produced where. And in order to do that, in order to decide what a living organism or a living machine prints out, you would need to have an interface. You need to have a kind of language. And synthetic biologists believe that they have that, that in fact, living machines actually have a sort of instructions. They have a code. It's DNA. Now, we heard earlier from um, David Ehrenfield the, the limits of the idea of code, of DNA as, as a code, but that's how they think. Um, that if you could just uh, take this, it's, it's kind of like software for the machine. You don't have to uh, have it printed out in ones and zeros on a, uh, on a long punch card, but it's, it's printed out in the letters G, T, A, and C on a long piece of protein. And if you could rewrite that code, then you could instruct the forest to give you a cup of tea or a, you know, vanilla ice cream or something. So I think I'm probably losing a lot of people here. Um, so I want to get a little bit more concrete about how you would do this. Um, the first thing is you'd need to find what is the code that would give you, let's say, vanilla. Vanilla is the second most um, uh, important spice in the world by terms of value. Um, and vanilla, the compound in question is vanillin. So we've been reading genomes, DNA, for about 30 or 40 years. We have a lot of data, and we can crunch through that. And we can work out, roughly speaking, which parts of the DNA code lead to an organism producing vanillin. So you can come up with a DNA sequence that, that looks like it will probably produce vanillin. G, T, T, C, C, A, G. That's a list of digital letters. The second step is you need to turn that into actual DNA. And that's not very tricky. You have machines called a DNA synthesizer. They're about the size of a, a photocopier. Um, and they make DNA for you, synthetic DNA. You can type into them that you want a piece of DNA that goes G, T, T, C, C, A, T, G, and it will print it out for you. Um, in fact, you don't really need a machine because there are companies on the internet that will do this for you. DNA 2.0, for example, where you go to their website, give them your credit card details, and for 30 cents per letter, you can order G, C, C, T, T, A, C, C, and they will send it by FedEx to your house. So now you have this little so-called genetic program, this piece of DNA. And you then have to put that into an actual living machine that will print out the vanilla for you. So synthetic biologists are most interested, actually, in yeast. Yeast, they see as a machine that takes sugar and turns it into beer. Um, but if they could reprogram it, it could take sugar and turn it into vanilla. So that's what they do. They engineer it into the yeast, and the yeast spits out vanillin. A real synthetic biology company will produce many different versions, many of that code, to find the best one. 
and then they'll have their little machine, their little factory that, uh, that produces vanillin. And because this is tiny, you want to have millions of those, you, you replicate them because they're living organisms and put them all into a big vat. And now you have a vat that when you put sugar in it, will produce vanillin. Does that make sense? Okay. So what you've done is you've gone from digital code over here, GTTCCCCA, to vanillin, um, which you can actually put in a milkshake or something. Um, and if I change the code over here, G-A-C-C-T-T, -T, um, it could produce patchouli over here, which is patchouli scent. Or I could do it, GTTC, change it over here as well, and what comes out over here could be cow's milk. Um, these aren't random hypothetical examples. These are real. So there's a company called Evolver. It's a symbio company that produces the vanillin through synthetic biology and yeast um, that's now sold and put in products. Um, the patchoulol is produced by Amaris, and it's sold through Ferminec, one of the biggest flavor and fragrance companies. And the milk, well, the milk proteins are being developed by a company called Moo Free, as in free of moo. Um, who are a Silicon Valley company, and they've developed yeast that will produce cow milk protein so you could make vegan cheese. That's going to hit the market, they say, who knows, in 2017. So you could take that milk, you could mix it with the vanilla, and in a way, I've then got a machine that will give me that ice cream that I wanted as a child. And it's not just those three things. There's now a whole basket of, uh, of compounds that are being printed out through synthetic organisms in these, these sort of production systems, everything from saffron um, and coconut oil, um, vetiver, vetiver is an interesting one, I'll talk about that in a minute, um, stevia and so forth, that are now hitting the marketplace right now. So what does this mean? Well, it means a lot. The first thing is I've taken vanillin and I've been able to make it in a vat, and so that vat is now a competitor to the 200,000 vanilla farmers in places like Madagascar, Comoros, Reunion, Uganda, Mexico. Um, and the patchouli that I've produced, that's now a competitor for the patchouli farmers in places like um, uh, uh, Indonesia and Madagascar. And so through all of those, I mentioned coconut oil. Coconut pro pro is uh, produced by about 25 million people in the Philippines depend on coconut production. Um, it's one in five people in the Philippines. Uh, cocoa is another one, and, and so forth and so on. Um, there's a company called Alilix in San Diego who produce vetiver oil. Vetiver is a, a fragrance oil, a musky fragrance oil, and they produce it in synthetic organisms. Um, up until recently, vetiver oil was mostly produced by uh, farmers in Haiti. It's probably the most important agricultural export crop for Haiti, 60,000 farmers in Haiti. That's the poorest uh, country in the Western world, and it's about to lose its most important agricultural expert, export because of synthetic biology, and so on and so on. Um, uh, the Evolver, the company I mentioned that are working on vanillin, have about a couple of dozen different projects they're working on with things like turmeric and ginger and ginseng and even human breast milk. Um, there's the US Department of Defense as a project to produce a thousand compounds of interest to the defense industry, interesting to know what they are, um, through printing them out in synthetic biology. And there are 200,000 plant-derived compounds. Synthetic biologists say that they can uh, produce any compound that you could find in a plant, they can now produce in a microbe. And that's what they're trying to do. It's a massive change in production. And not just um, microbes. Probably one of the leading synthetic biology projects is to produce artemisinin. It's an anti-malarial compound. Um, and it's previously grown by 100,000 farmers in East Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, but as of last year, about a third of global supply came from one big tank of synthetic organisms in Italy um, by uh, Sanofi Aventus. And almost overnight, the planted area of artemisinin dropped by two-thirds. That's something in the order of 70,000 farmers looking for something else to plant. Um, and that is not only... Uh, terrible for those farmers and the economies and or agricultural economies around them. There's now actually work being done in Israel by a team to take those same genetic sequences and build them into tobacco. So that in fact, rather than it being produced um, on the fields in East Africa or even in a vat in, in, in um, Italy, it will be produced on the fields of, that are controlled by Philip Morris and, and so forth here in the US. So that important commodity that supported 100,000 farmers, poor farmers, has moved to the control of large monoculture agriculture. 
and so on and so forth. Um, and, and there's many more issues besides. I haven't talked about biosafety, the fact that you're producing very extreme organisms that, that really are very much more novel than the sort of genetic engineering that we've seen so far. Um, I haven't talked about the fact that it's quite easy now to print out Ebola or smallpox um, or something like that. And that certainly has the world's militaries both worried and excited, um, as you could imagine. And, um, but really, I think where this is, is significant is in the longer term is this isn't just the only digital production technology that's coming down the line. I've already mentioned 3D printing. In fact, there's a lot of work on um, uh, flexible production through flexible robotics, um, also work on drones in agriculture. And I'd echo what Pat said earlier, that we can't think of these technologies one at a time and look at their economic impacts one at a time. We have to look at the new... Um, the, 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 the new arrangements that these technologies together are creating. I think we're moving into a world where a set of new digital production technologies of stuff, whether that's digital production of compounds through synthetic biology, digital production through 3D printing, or digital production through flexible robotics in large robotic factories, means that anything can be produced anywhere without very many people involved in the process, all the way from the field, where we're removing uh, the farmers who grow vanillin or sorry, vanilla um, or stevia, um, all the way through to the production that used to be uh, workers and, and craftsmen. Um, that's, I think, a discussion that nobody's yet had that we need to urgently have because that production system is changing. I want to end with uh, two maybe glimmers of hope. Earlier this year, um, a natural soap company, so-called natural soap company called Ecova, um, let it be known that they were going to move over their soap production to using an oil from a synthetic biology algae in place of using coconut oil or palm oil. Um, when that became known, tens of thousands of consumers um, reacted against that, signed petitions, wrote letters, wrote on their Facebook page and so forth, and they kind of had to back off a little bit, and they're now caught up amidst stakeholder processes trying to work out what they do with that very strong reaction that there was to use of synthetic biology. A week and a half ago, or, or just over a week ago, uh, the 194 nations of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity agreed to a set of decisions that are the first global decisions on governance of synthetic biology. Um, they agreed that every country should set up regulations on synthetic biology. Those regulations should be based on precaution, and there should be all sorts of assessment, including socioeconomic assessment. Um, many of the countries that were at those negotiations, which have been going on for four years, um, wanted a complete moratorium. In fact, it was the countries of the South. It was countries like Malaysia, the Philippines, Bolivia, um, and African countries who did not want this technology to move into commercial use and, uh, and, and pushed very, very hard for that position. I think what this shows is that there is a sort of native awareness and appetite to slow down and maybe stop and reverse this new production paradigm in its tracks. And I think we need to build on that. Thank you.